distractions that we could look upon your face and see your beauty, that we would hear your message this morning. Thank you for Shane. Give him clarity, uh, give him peace, and let us just hear you, Lord, speak today. We pray this in Jesus' name. You know, um, it's a matter of perspective. Like, situations, they matter, and the people that are involved matter. But I want to begin this morning by saying um, that you matter too. Like, what you bring to the situation matters. Your, your experiences matter. Your emotions matter. Your stress matters. Because here's the reality. We can be looking at the exact same thing and simply not see the same thing. But, but let's go through a couple of examples. Let's, let's look at this picture on the screen. And here's the question I want you to answer for me. Is it moving? Uh -huh. How many for you is it moving? Oh, is there yeah. motion? Yep. Okay, raise them high. How many of you are like, it's not moving? It's not what you're talking about. Stop. How many of you are just asleep? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, all right. It's moving again. Awesome. It's moving. Now, according to the internet, which is always dangerous, <laughs> always dangerous, there's a lot of theories, but, but one of the theories is this. If there is motion, it means that you are in a state of stress. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a theory. You said it was a theory. <laughs> the faster it is moving, the more stress you're experiencing. That so if theory. it's not moving very much at all, you're in a relative state of calmness. Now here's the point, here's the point. The point is this. It's a matter of perspective. Like the picture matters, but you matter. What you bring to the picture matters. Your experiences, your, your wounds, your stories, apparently your stress. Because we can be looking at the same thing and simply not see the same thing. Look, let's take a look at this picture. And I want to ask this question. What color is it? Oh, oh, how many of you are wonderful and see it as gray and blue? Come on, that's what I'm talking about. How many of you I thought this was a hoax. Like, I'm not even kidding. I was so convinced that this was just like some joke that I actually pulled it up on my phone and I went to my wife and I said, what do you see? And she's like, a shoe? I was like, yeah. What, what color do you see? And she kind of looked at me weird and she's like, it's pink and white? I was like, no! That's not possible! It is gray and blue! Now, now a couple of theories are floating around the internet. And here is one of the dominant theories. It is gray and blue if you are dominant on the left side of your brain. Oh. Some of you are like, that still means nothing to me. <laughs> it's part of your brain that, that is the more analytical or practical side of your brain. So there's like 20 of us in this room that are practical. <laughs> if it's pink and white, then you're dominant on the right side of your brain, which is the intuitive or the imaginative side of your brain. Okay, so, so tell your neighbor, tell your neighbor which side of the brain that you like. Okay, now come back to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. Here's the point. Here's the point. It's a matter of perspective. The picture matters, sure, but you matter. What you bring to the picture matters. Your experiences, your wounds, apparently which side of the brain you prefer matters because we can be looking at the same thing and simply not see the same thing. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. Yeah, that one might be a little tough to find, right? It's all right. Every Bible has a table of contents in the very first couple of pages. 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to be looking at verses 9 uh, through around 18. 
1 Kings 19 is interesting because verse 9 gives us a location and a question. But the text begins with a location and a question. 1 Kings 19.9 gives us the location. It starts off and says, There he, referring to Elijah the prophet, There Elijah went into a cave. So the location is a cave. And shortly after we get the location, we get the question. Here's the question. God speaking. He says, What are you doing here, Elijah? I think that's an important question to ask. Because if you know what has happened the last couple of chapters, this is a weird location for Elijah to be in. Going back to chapter 17, there's a lot going on. At the beginning of chapter 17, the nation of Israel is ruled by a Baal-worshipping king. That sentence should make no sense. A king of Israel is a Baal worshiper? That's absurd. But that's what we have. His name is Ahab. And Elijah comes to Ahab and he, this is what he says. He says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, I'm in 1 Kings 17, 1. Whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. In other words, here comes a drought. Why? Because Ahab is out of control. And he is leading the people astray. And after Elijah gives this announcement, he goes into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, God provides for him. He actually sends ravens with food in their mouth, morning, afternoon, and night, to give him food to feed him. And it's a good thing he's hanging out in the wilderness because Ahab is ticked. Like as soon as the drought starts, Ahab's like, that's it, I'm killing Elijah. And he can't find Elijah, so he starts just killing any, old, any prophet that he can find in the nation of Israel. And he kills quite a few. But he just couldn't get a hold of Elijah. Until chapter 18, Elijah comes to Ahab. He says, all right, all right, all right. I see that you're pretty upset and you want to, you know, get this drought thing figured out. He goes, so let's have a contest. How about it? Let's go up to Mount Carmel, and this is what we're going to do. We are going to actually see which God is the true God. Whoever wins the contest, we worship. So in verse 8, 19 of chapter 18, Elijah says to Ahab, Summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel, and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now this is the contest. They're going to put two sacrifices, kill two animals, and they're going to put them each on a pile of wood, an altar. And then they're going to ask their God to provide the fire. Whatever it takes, just ask the God to provide the fire. Whatever God provides the fire, true God. And Elijah goes, hey, prophets of Baal, you go first. It's first thing in the morning, and the prophets of Baal are you know, dancing and chanting, and they're, they're screaming. And after about three, four hours, it's afternoon, Elijah decides to taunt them. He's like, oh, maybe you should scream a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping. And of course, they're like, all right, we'll take it up a notch. So they're screaming louder, and they start cutting themselves, because that's what death does. Death doesn't just devour what's around you. It also looks to devour the agent of darkness, you yourself. So they're cutting themselves, and they're screaming to Baal, and finally it gets to dinner time, and Elijah says, you know what, why don't you guys take a rest? It's my turn. In chapter 18, verses 36 and 37, Elijah just says a very simple prayer, and then in verse 38, God responds. He says, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up water in the trench. Oh yeah, I forgot a detail. Elijah said, I'm going to make it actually harder for me to win. I'm going to dump, you know, dozens of gallons of water all over the sacrifice. So much so that it fills up a trench surrounding the sacrifice. And even still, when God sends the fire, it not only consumes the sacrifice, but it consumes the altar and all of the water. Kind of a cool trick. You know what I mean? And if that wasn't cool enough, then Elijah finally goes to Ahab and says this, Okay, it'll rain now. And sure enough, the heavens open, and it begins to rain. I mean, this is crazy. These two chapters are phenomenal. Astounding. 
astounding, miraculous. Which is, which is why it is so weird to find Elijah cowering in a cave in verse 9 of chapter 19. It's like, what's he doing in a cave? Well, if you go to the beginning of chapter 19, you, you, you understand why he's running. Why is he running? Because Jezebel, the queen of Ahab, heard what happened on Mount Carmel, and her response wasn't to repent. Instead, she says, okay, I'm going to kill that guy by tomorrow, and I won't eat till I do. One threat, and Elijah's like, oh my goodness, i got to get out of here, and he takes off running. As a matter of fact, in verses 3 through 5, listen to what Elijah is doing whenever he's running for his life. Verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He's back in the wilderness. But this time, he's running for his life. He came to a brush broom or broom bush, sat down under it, and listen to this, and prayed that he might die. Asking death to fix his problems. Asking death to be his companion. Asking death to deliver something that only life can give. He goes into the wilderness and begs for death to come. He says, I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep with no intention of waking up. Like, like the, the fact that Elijah is in a cave in verse 9 is weird because of the chapters that have come right before it. I mean, he watched fire come down from heaven, but one threat, and he's out in the wilderness, and he's begging for death to provide for him. I'm like, did he forget the last 40 to 50 verses? Like, what is happening in his, in his mind? As a matter of fact, what's even more interesting is that in verse 9, when he goes into a cave in the ancient world, caves were tombs. He's going into a cave to get as close to death and darkness as he can possibly get. For that's what caves are, a mixture of darkness and death. And while he's in a cave, he receives a question. Elijah, what are you doing? Seriously, Elijah, like, what are you doing? I mean, have you not been a part of the story? You know, I'll be honest, that question that God gives in verse 9, from one perspective, I, I think it's actually pretty easy to hear it as an accusation. You know, to hear God frustrated, to hear God lashing out at Elijah, saying, darn it, Elijah, what are you doing? What are you going to care? For. And after all the magic tricks I've done, you go running away at one threat? What are you doing here? Oh, you wear me out, Elijah. Like, from one perspective, I, I can see this as an accusation. Especially if, especially if your view of God is one that is, that is always just looking for your flaws. Just always looking for, for what you're doing wrong. That's always looking for a loophole to kick you out of heaven and into hell. I mean, if that's your perspective of God, then you will read that question as an accusation. But the problem is, is that the text doesn't seem to match that perspective. I mean, think about it. In chapter 17, Elijah goes to the wilderness and God meets him there by sending him ravens. In chapter 18, Elijah's on Mount Carmel and God meets him there by sending fire. In chapter 19, God finds Elijah in a cave. And even in the depths of the cave, Elijah can't run as far away as God can pursue. So I get it. From one perspective, you can see this as an accusation, but the problem is, is that it doesn't match the picture of God. This doesn't sound like a God in the last three chapters that's trying to get away from you. It sounds like a God that is recklessly in pursuit of you. And sure, at times, 
He will come in a meal. And at times he'll come in a fire. And at times he'll come in a question. Hey, Elijah. What are you doing here, man? Why? What are you looking for, buddy? In verse 10, Elijah gives his perspective. And he's a little rude. He says in verse 10, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. I think you have to read this with, with dripping sarcasm. <laughs> I mean, he's cowering in a cave asking death to come and be his companion. And God says, where are you? And he's like, listen, I've been very zealous for the Lord, God Almighty. The Israelites, they rejected your covenant. They tore down your altars. They put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Basically, Elijah's saying this. It's not fair. I have been faithful to you. And Israel has been anything but faithful. And they're killing the prophets. And what's their reward? They get to go on living. What's my reward? It's the same reward you gave Abel. Murder. They're going to kill me. What kind of God is that? You know what's interesting is, is that when you're in a cave, when you feel isolated and alone, question of fairness seems to dominate your mind. Why is it not fair? But here's the reality, whether, whether Elijah realizes it or not, the question of the cave is not, is this fair? The question of the cave is this, God, will you meet me even here? See, Elijah's accusation is actually a question of identity. He's asking the question, who is God? Will you abandon me like everyone else? Will you leave me in my time of greatest need? What kind of God are you? Are you a God that pursues? Or are you a God that leaves me at the first opportunity? Whether Elijah realizes it or not, the question of the cave is not, is this fair? The question of the cave is, who is God? And in verse 11, God says, well, I'll show you who I am. Verse 11, go out and stand on the mountain. Actually, I need to reread that and insert a couple of words that are assumed. Go out of the cave. Go out of the cave and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. You want to know who I am? Go out of the cave. You want to know my identity? Step out of the cave and step out of the darkness and enter into the light of my presence. I mean, it, it amazes me how often I entrust the darkness with something that only the light can handle. I, I, I do it all the time, and, and from my perspective, it makes so much sense. Like, no matter how small or how large the stress might be, it just seems so natural. It just seems so familiar to go into the cave because the solution must be found there. Found in the darkness, found in running away from God. It's almost like this natural pull, like I'm united to something that is dragging me into the darkness of the cave. It's crazy to me. But time and time again, I entrust the darkness with something only the light can handle. And I think this morning, in this text, in this room, to me and to you, God's saying the same thing he said to Elijah. Step out of your cave. Just, just leave the cave. Step out of the darkness and come into the light. Stop entrusting the darkness with something only I can handle. Step out of the cave and step into my grace. 
What's amazing to me about this text is that God commands Elijah to step out of the cave. And guess what Elijah does? He disobeys. God's like, come out of the cave. And Elijah's like, I'm good here, thanks. Because what's interesting is the last half of verses 11 and into verse 12, Elijah sees from inside the cave, he experiences God's presence in three magnificent ways. The first is there's this great and powerful wind that is so powerful it can shatter mountains, destroy rocks. And Elijah experiences it from inside the cave. And then you have this massive earthquake, and it actually shakes the mountain that Elijah is cowering in. And he experiences the earthquake from inside the cave. And then God sends fire from heaven, like in chapter 18. But this time, instead of Elijah standing on the mountain to see, to look at the fire, he's inside of the mountain, in the cave. It's not until verse 13. When Elijah hears a gentle whisper, it says, when Elijah heard the whisper, he pulled the cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Notice Elijah's relationship to the darkness. God says, come out of the cave. Elijah says, I'm good. Then he hears a whisper. Whisper. And Elijah comes to the mouth of the cave, the edge of the cave. He makes sure that he has just enough darkness to protect him. And if that's not enough, then he grabs his cloak and pulls it over his face, hoping that the darkness can shake, can, can protect him from the light. Elijah is so used to entrusting the darkness with something the light can handle. He reminds me a lot of Adam and Eve. God comes. What do they do? They go and hide. And if that's not enough, let's sew some fig leaves up to make sure that we're cloaked enough from the darkness keep us from the light. This is so strange. Whenever I see prophets and, and myself afraid of the light. You want to know why it's strange? It's because as children, we were afraid of the dark, not the light. Can I get an amen on that? Like, am I the only one? Oh, man. I lived in the basement with my brother. You want to talk about terrifying. Cave-like. Yeah, have a room in a basement. Oh, man, I don't know who made our basement, but they were an evil architect. No question. Because this is what they said. They're like, you know what? This is, is going to be a basement. It's going to be super dark. I have an idea. Let's put the light switch at the very bottom of the steps. That's awesome. <laughs> then it's like, oh, I want to go to my room. And it's like, I have to descend down into the belly of the beast. Like, I have to walk into darkness. And then I get down to the bottom, and I'm like shaking, trying to find the light. And I flip it on. I'm like, okay, we're good. Until I have to leave the basement. And then I'm like, do I obey my parents and turn off the lights and save energy and save money? Or do I leave it on and, you know, not be terrified? So typically it was one of those things where I'd stand at the bottom of the basement. I'm like, okay, 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 okay. Bam! Turn it off and then I try not to pull a hammy running up, you know? <laughs> it's terrifying. I remember there were nights where I'm laying in my bed and my older brother is, is, is laying over in his bed across the basement. We'd been laying there for like 10, 15 minutes. And finally I'd say, uh, hey Justin, you, you wait, man. Silence. It, it's interesting whenever you're in those situations and you, you cry out a question and you don't hear a response, how the darkness seems to get darker. And I remember trying to pull my blankets over my face, thinking maybe the darkness will protect me from the darkness. And I would start to tremble until, until my eye would catch my He-Man nightlight across the room. Because <laughs> this is something also that's important to remember. Even in the darkest of places, even the smallest light can bring you comfort. Even the smallest of lights in the darkest of caves can give you hope. As children, we were afraid of the dark, but here's what's so weird. The older that we get, an inversion occurs. We become afraid of the light. And we live our lives running from the light. I mean, a very simple way to prove this is every single one of our smartphones comes with a password that typically only you know. I'm not gonna share that with anyone else. I mean, why do you think 
disappearing text messages are so popular. But why do you think that, that even you know going in ghost mode, dark mode, so that people can't track their browsing history is so popular? It's because we trust the darkness more than we do the light. We do not want all that we are pulled out into the light. No, thank you. We'll keep it hidden. We'll keep it secret. The problem is this. The cave can only offer you more fear, more loneliness, and more and more darkness. Somewhere along the lines, something got mixed up. For as adults, we're more afraid of stepping out of the cave and into the light than we are of staying in the cave where darkness and death loom. One of my really good friends, her name is Tracy, she, um, she has the spiritual gift of blindness. And what I mean by that is that she just she cannot see the negative or the evil in the person. Like she doesn't look at this person and see sin or anything. She just sees what Christ can do in them, and, and she just treats them as if Christ is already doing it. She's amazing at it. And so she's friends with everyone. And several years ago, she was living in this neighborhood with her, with her family. Her next door neighbor was, was a drug addict. I mean, it, what the drug was, wasn't always clear. Um, there was some mixture of heroin and pills and alcohol. And, and whenever her neighbor was, was, was high or was coming down off of some sort of high, her neighbor's son would, would wander over to Tracy's house. He was probably just looking for a nightlight. One day, Tracy and, and her kids were, were coming outside, and her neighbor's son was over there with them, and Tracy was going to get the mail, and, and Tracy looked over and saw her neighbor sitting on, on the front step. And so Tracy walked over and, and sat down and said, Hey, are you doing okay? So Tracy gathers her kids and goes in the house, and that night she's sitting at her kitchen table, and she is weeping. She's like, I don't know what I did. I had no idea what happened. I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just trying to love on her, and she just flipped out. I, I call this wake-up call theology. Wake-up call theology. Have, have you ever had a really terrifying or terrible roommate or parent that says, I'm going to wake you up by flipping on the light. Let's just flip on the lights. Have you ever had that happen to you? I don't know about you, but what I do is I let out these groans. I go, you know, grabbing the pillow and I'm pulling it over my head because I've grown so accustomed to the darkness that the light actually hurts. It actually causes me pain. And I think that's what was happening with Tracy and her neighbor. And I think that's what's happening with Elijah. And I think that's what's happening to a lot of us in this room. We have grown so accustomed to darkness that darkness actually dictates our perspective. And when the light comes to us, our response is to do anything that we can to avoid it. To just shut out the light. Maybe what we do is we hurt ourselves. Maybe what we do is we hurt others. Maybe what we do is even cry out to God, it's not fair. But the question of the cave is not one of fairness. The question of the cave is one of identity. God, will you meet me here? Will you find me here? Are you willing to fight for me? Or will you give up on me like everyone else? What I love about scripture is that it persistently responds to that question of who is God? 
I mean, over and over and over, Scripture is telling us who God is. And if I could summarize Scripture's articulation of God's identity, this is how I would describe it. Our God is a God who pursues. Oh, passionately. I mean, even in Genesis chapter 1, we talked about this last night. It's not like God was fulfilling something in himself as he was creating. No, it was an act of pursuit. And even when we became one flesh with death, even when we fell by disobeying, that's not where the story ends. That's where it begins. I mean, even when we did stuff like, let's build the Tower of Babel so high that we can knock God off his throne in Genesis chapter 11. Guess what? In Genesis chapter 12, God says, I'm going to select Abraham to have a nation that will bless all the nations. He's in pursuit of us. Even in the midst of our rebellion. I mean, whenever we are in moments without direction, God would send us a judge. Whenever we are in moments without hope, God sends us an exodus. Whenever we are without options at all, God immobilizes the sun. Why? Because our God is a God who pursues passionately, persistently, breaking all of the rules, doing whatever it takes to get to you in the cave. But there's one thing I've learned. I've learned that it's really hard to see God clearly from inside of a cave. It's really hard to answer the question, who is God? When you're clinging to the darkness found in a cave. So, so here's my response. Come out of your cave. Stop entrusting the darkness with something only the light can handle. Step out of your cave. Because until we step out of the cave, it is really hard to gain a divine perspective. It's really hard to see God clearly. It's really hard to see ourselves clearly. Because many of us in this room, we look into the mirror and all we see is something that we hate. We look into a mirror and we see a gender we're not sure that we want. We see a body that we think is too big or arms that we think are too small. We look into the mirror and all we see is the pain of rejection and the pain of abandonment, the disappointment of a father, the withholding of a mother. We look into the mirror and all we see is the lie that we are alone. But when God looks at you, he sees beauty beyond measure. He sees joy without end. He sees hope for a broken world. Hope for racial reconciliation. Hope to advance the gospel into the caves that are cowering with people in darkness. When he looks at you, he sees a child worthy of pursuit. It's a matter of perspective. But it's really hard to see from inside of a cave. So step out of your cave. Come out of the cave. Leave the darkness and step into his glorious light. I mean, whenever I talk about God's pursuit and I think about stepping out of the cave, I, I can't help but think about Jesus. Who had a cave of his own, you know. We call it a tomb. Three days later, he stepped out of that darkness and into life. He's asking us to do the same thing. You see, it's, it's a matter of perspective. For we can be looking at the exact same thing and just simply not be seeing the same thing. So here's my question for you this morning. Can you see him? And if you can't, if you can't, then step out of your grave. Let's pray for this day. Lord Jesus, give us eyes to see. Father God, may we hear your heart beating. 
Holy Spirit. Give us a resurrection as you gave Christ himself. Father, stir us. Father, do not allow us to sit still. Father, call us out of the cave. Father, I pray for these students. I pray, Lord, that they experience your hope in a powerful way. I pray, Lord, I pray that they experience your grace in a way that is 